Hello there, uh, welcome back to my channel and in this video, let's understand three very important aspects regarding anemia. So what is going to be the learning objectives for this session? In this video, we are going to understand three things which are repeatedly asked in your examination. And what are those? First is the definition of anemia. The second is the classification of anemia. Remember that we can classify anemia by using three things. It can be classified on the basis of morphology, it can be classified on the etiological basis and it can be also classified based upon the severity. And the third thing that we are going to learn is the physiological basis of the clinical features in anemia. So let's start the session. So how are we going to define anemia? Remember that anemia is a clinical condition. It is not a disease as such in which the hemoglobin concentration of the blood is below the normal range. We know what is the normal range. What's the normal range of the hemoglobin? In adults, if we have to speak about, the normal range of hemoglobin is going to be different in males and the females. In case of males, the hemoglobin range is 14 to 18 gram percentage or 14 to 18 gram per deciliter. And in case of females, this range will be 12 to 16 gram percentage or 12 to 16 gram per deciliter. So what is anemia? Anemia is a clinical condition in which the hemoglobin concentration of the blood is below the normal range. Two very important words which we should add here is for the age and sex of the individual. Why? Because the concentration of the hemoglobin is going to be different in different sexes. So after understanding the definition, let's understand the classification of anemia. The first classification that we are going to learn is what is called as etiological classification or it is also called as Witbeis classification. So what do we understand by this word etiology? Etiology means the cause. Depending upon the cause of anemia, we are going to classify the anemia. The first and foremost and the most important and the most common form of anemia which we encounter is what is called as nutritional deficiency anemia. And in this, the most common and very important is this anemia which is called as the iron deficiency anemia. Second comes with the vitamin B12 deficiency anemia. Anemia can also occur because of the folic acid deficiency and also because of the protein deficiency. So all these come under the category of nutritional deficiency anemia. These are the examples. Next, there could be also anemia occurring because of the blood loss. So whenever there is blood loss, what do we call it? We call it hemorrhage. That's why the anemia which is occurring because of the blood loss is what is called as hemorrhagic anemia and we can subclassify this hemorrhagic anemia into two categories. One is called as acute hemorrhage, another one is called as chronic hemorrhage. Okay, that much is more than enough. The third category is what is called as hemolytic anemia where the hemolysis of the cells is occurring. So what do you mean by hemolysis? Hemolysis means premature lysis or premature destruction of the RBCs which is going to occur. We all know that the lifespan of the RBCs is 120 days. Because of any reason, there could be premature destruction of the RBCs. All those come under the category of hemolytic anemia and hemolytic anemia is subclassified again by two methods. I will let you know what are those two methods. Then we have the next form which is called as the aplastic anemia. So the meaning of aplasia is that the bone marrow is not producing enough number of cells. So there is an impaired production coming from the bone marrow which could be occurring because of certain drugs, which could be occurring because of exposure to the radiation, which could be occurring because of some disorders of the bone marrow. So such a kind of anemia wherein the bone marrow itself is unable to produce the red blood cells that is called as aplastic anemia and the last one is what is called as anemia which is occurring due to chronic diseases. So there are five subtypes in etiological classification, nutritional deficiency, blood loss, hemolytic anemia, aplastic anemia and the anemia which is occurring due to chronic diseases. Let's understand a little bit about the hemolytic anemia as to how it is subclassified. So the subclassification of hemolytic anemia, one way is that it can be classified based upon whether the 
pathology is in the rbc or the pathology is outside the rbc so the pathology or the defect is in the rbc that is called as corpuscular hemolytic anemia and if it is outside the rbc that is called as extra corpuscular hemolytic anemia very simple corpuscular means something is wrong with the rbc because of which the destruction of the rbc is occurring prematurely extra corpuscular means something is wrong outside the rbc because of which the rbc's destruction is occurring prematurely so what are the corpuscular causes three very important causes one is called as hemoglobinopathy so what is going to come under hemoglobinopathy is two very important disorders one is thalassemia another one is sickle cell anemia okay here the problem is with the hemoglobin either qualitatively or quantitatively next thing is membrane defects there could be something wrong with the membrane of the rbc and which this is comes to your mind when i say membrane this is membrane defects yes that is hereditary spirocytosis and the third one which you learn in your biochemistry that is called as enzymopathies one very important enzyme which is required for the integrity of the rbc is what is called as G6PD. This is glucose 6-phosphate. So G6PD, if it is deficient, then even we will get early hemolysis, premature destruction. Now the extra corpuscular causes include microangiopathies. This this is this is a very big term which gives you a meaning that there is something wrong with the blood vessels. Okay, angio means blood vessels micro means smaller blood vessels so this is a disorder of the smaller blood vessels many toxic agents many drugs incompatible blood transfusion we know that and even autoimmune disorders so all these are the causes for extra corpuscular hemolytic anemia this is one way of classifying hemolytic anemia hemolytic anemia can be also classified in one more way what is that way so if the hemolysis is occurring in the mononuclear phagocytic cells okay of the spleen that is called as extravascular hemolysis what is that called extravascular hemolysis but if the hemolysis is not occurring in the mononuclear phagocytic cells of the spleen and it is occurring in the blood vessels now that is what is called as intravascular hemolysis so we have two types of hemolytic anemia here one is extravascular extravascular means the hemolysis is not occurring in the blood vessels but it is occurring in the usual place where it has to occur but it is occurring prematurely that is mononuclear phagocytic cells of the spleen so this is called as extravascular hemolysis but if the hemolysis is occurring intravascularly with a very good example is abo incompatibility that is incompatible blood uh, transfusion there the hemolysis occurs intravascularly okay so we have two classifications one is corpuscular and extra corpuscular another one is intravascular and extravascular intravascular means within blood vessels okay within the blood vessels hemolysis is occurring within the blood vessels okay this is the sub classification of hemolytic anemia if you want to write you can write if you want to leave it you can leave it but if you write it your answer will carry more weightage then what is the morphological classification the morphological classification is also called as the Wintrobes classification and it is based on two very important parameters one is the cell size the morphology itself means the size and shape of the cell so one is based on the cell size which is given by a red blood cell indice which is called as mean corpuscular volume second is it is based on how much is the hemoglobin saturation that is how much is the content of the hemoglobin within the rbc which is given by mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration so if we know these two values we can find out as to what type of morphological anemia the person is suffering from one kind in this is what is called as normocytic normochromic anemia wherein the mcv is also normal and mchc is also normal that means the size of the cell is also normal and the hemoglobin saturation inside the rbc is also normal but the cell count is less so what could be the two very important causes which come under normocytic normochromic anemia hemorrhage 
very important is hemorrhagic anemia here the hemorrhage is happening the number of red blood cells is reducing because of the hemorrhage but the size and the hemoglobin saturation which is present inside the rbc is going to remain the same second one as i have already told you under the etiological classification there is something called as aplastic anemia wherein the bone marrow itself is not producing enough amount of cells so the number of cells is reduced but the cell size and the hemoglobin concentration inside each cell is going to remain same so here the mcv and the mchc is going to be normal but the rbc count will be very much reduced so this is what is called as normocytic normochromic anemia the second one is microcytic hypochromic anemia microcytes means the cell is smaller in size hypochromic means what the hemoglobin saturation inside the rbc is also less so here what is going to happen mcv value will be below normal and mchc value also will be below normal so what is happening in normocytic normochromic mcv is normal and also mchc is also normal both are normal so the best example for microcytic hypochromic anemia which you should never forget is iron deficiency if at all you see a patient whose mcv and mchc is normal it's 90 percentage of the times it has to be iron deficiency anemia of course you should remember one more condition that is thalassemia which is also can which can also lead to microcytic hypochromic anemia the third is what is called as macrocytic anemia so what's happening here is the cell size is larger so when do you think the cell size will be bigger when the immature cells are entering into the circulation so when does this occur this occurs when there is vitamin b12 deficiency because we know that vitamin b12 as well as folic acid they are required for the maturation of the rbc so the maturation of the rbc is not occurring at that point of time we see immature cells entering into the circulation that's why what is going to happen is mcv will be higher than the normal but the person is suffering from anemia so macrocytic two very important reasons b12 deficiency and folic acid deficiency so this is the second classification which we have learned third classification is based on the severity and this classification what i am giving you is taken from the who's website okay so we classify here based upon the severity how much is the hemoglobin level and there are three types mild moderate and severe so what is severe what do we understand by severe anemia whenever the hemoglobin is less than 8 grams per deciliter irrespective of the fact whether that's a male or a female that is termed as severe anemia so what is moderate anemia whenever the hemoglobin is somewhere between 8 to 11 remember these values grams per deciliter irrespective of the fact whether it's a female or a male we call it as a moderate anemia and when do we call a mild anemia mild anemia is when the hemoglobin is 11 to 12 gram per deciliter in case of a female and hemoglobin is 11 to 13 gram per deciliter in case of a male so this is how we classify anemia based upon the values of the hemoglobin into mild moderate and severe so we have learned the three types of classifications what, what was the first one the first one was based upon the etiology that's called as the etiological classification second one was based upon the morphology that's called as the morphological classification and third is based upon the severity how much is the hemoglobin less so here we have mild moderate and severe anemia so this finishes the classification next let's understand the pathophysiology of the clinical features so what is happening here in anemia is that there is a reduction of the hemoglobin so when hemoglobin is reduced what is going to happen to the oxygen carrying capacity of course the oxygen carrying capacity is also going to reduce but remember this very important thing that in a normal person who is at rest only 25 percentage of the oxygen which is carried by the arterial blood majority is carried by the hemoglobin it is extracted by the tissues so remaining 75 percentage is reserve here so there is an enormous reserve when a person works or exercises 
that is why the metabolic needs of the tissues and the body can be met in mild cases of anemia so that means in mild cases of anemia usually we don't see any symptoms okay when the hemoglobin is somewhere between 10 to 11 10 to 12 10 to 13 we don't see any symptoms why because only 25 percentage of the oxygen carried by the arterial blood is extracted by the tissue so enormous reserve is still present even if the person is exercising but the metabolic needs cannot be met in moderate to severe anemia because there is more reduction in the hemoglobin so these kind of people if they begin to exercise they begin to stress themselves a little bit they will start having the symptoms why the symptoms appear the symptoms are basically appearing because of the tissue hypoxia because hemoglobin is the most important vehicle which is carrying oxygen to the tissues and when hemoglobin is not there of course the tissues are going to suffer from what is called as tissue hypoxia so whenever there is tissue hypoxia what is going to happen there will be some compensatory mechanisms which are going to be activated especially from the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system so they are compensated by what is called as a cardio respiratory reflexes so what is this compensation so what is going to happen there is going to be an increased rate as well as depth of respiration so this can cause breathlessness which is also called as dyspnea there is an increase in the heart rate whenever there is an increase in the heart rate this can cause palpitations and tachycardia tachycardia is increase in the heart rate palpitations is I'm 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 experiencing or I'm feeling my own heartbeat that is what is called as the palpitation of course because of the muscle hypoxia there is going to be a fatigue this is the most common symptom a person is going to tell you who is suffering from anemia that I'm feeling tiredness I'm feeling lethargy I'm feeling fatigued and when we look into the mucous membrane the mucous membrane appears paler this is what is called as pallor this is what is called as pallor of course there is going to be involvement of the other organ system so these symptoms what i am telling you these are the common symptoms irrespective of the fact whichever anemia the person is suffering from the person may suffer from iron deficiency b12 deficiency chronic hemorrhage hemolytic whatever the person says i feel this snake i am having palpitations tachycardia i feel fatigued i feel lethargic and when you look into the mucous membranes the mucous membrane exhibit what is called as the pallor okay so where do we look for the pallor do you know that we look for the pallor in the conjunctiva in the lower part of the conjunctiva this part of the conjunctiva now that is what is called as the palpebral conjunctiva so when i when i pull my lower eyelid down i'm going to see that conjunctiva that's called as the palpebral so when i look into that palpebral conjunctiva it should have a pinkish tinge or if that pinkish tinge has reduced that suggests you that the person is having pallor. I'll show you one more diagram. See here, we can see. Can we see any pink area here? No. So that means this is severe anemia. So what did we finish in this video? We finished three very important aspects of anemia. Definition, classification. What classifications? Three types, morphological, etiological, and based upon the severity and then we also understood the pathophysiology or the physiological basis of the clinical features if you want me to make a separate video on iron deficiency anemia which also asked as a short note for you guys please let me know in the comment section thank you for watching